May I invite you to please rise from your seats once again, and let's take a look. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. At the count of three, let's all read together aloud, please. One, two, read. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we would like to thank you and bless you, Lord. There's so much to thank you for. And we would like to ask for your forgiveness if we have not thanked you well enough. Lord, you have been faithful to us. You've never abandoned us. You've never forsaken us. You've always been there for us. You've been our provider. You have been our protector. You have been our guide. You have been our wisdom, our refuge, our strength, our joy, and our peace. Lord, words are not enough to be able to express all that you have done for us and all that you are. And we just want to glorify you this morning, O oh God, in our hearts. And our prayer, Lord, is that as we listen to the Word of God, we would honor your Word by paying attention to everything that is spoken. I pray for myself, O oh God, that you may not allow me to bungle up your word, but allow me to speak the word with authority and with your presence accompanying it, O Lord. I pray that you will open our minds and open our hearts, O God, and let the Holy Spirit be our mentor and our teacher this morning. Lord, whatever has, is or will be achieved later on, we will give you back all the glory and the praises and the thanks in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's be seated in the presence of the Lord. I've entitled this morning's sermon, Heart Religion. Yes, now just to borrow some thoughts from John MacArthur, he said that there are three kinds of religion. The first religion is called head religion, which trusts in religious knowledge. Now, this was the kind of religion that the Pharisees and the scribes had. And just to be able to describe it to you, allow me to speak the words of Jesus Christ as he spoke to his disciples in Matthew 23 and verses 1 to 3. And it reads, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses, Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and they do not do them. Now, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ did not mince words with the Pharisees and the scribes. He actually labeled them as a brood of vipers. He labeled them as hypocrites. Jesus Christ, in fact, said one time that they were nothing but whitewashed tombs. And the problem with the Pharisees and the scribes was not that they were lacking in knowledge. They had a lot of biblical knowledge. They studied the Old Testament scriptures. They interpreted it. The problem, however, was what had, what had been in their minds did not go down to their hearts. And that is why whatever they were teaching they actually did not observe them. And this is actually an indictment on people who put knowledge, they put a great premium on knowledge, but unfortunately, it is not translated in their own lives. And so this was the kind of religion that the Pharisees and the scribes had. The second kind of religion is what is called as the hand religion, which trusts in good deeds. Now, if you have been with me for quite some time, you understand that our relationship with the Lord is not based on our performance. It is not based on our good works. And the very plain and simple reason is that the standard of God is perfection. And you and I know that because we are sinners by nature, we can never attain to the standard that God requires. And therefore, if we were to base our hope and our salvation 
on good works, we actually have no hope. We will be disappointed and frustrated at the end of the day. So, the only thing that we can trust is not our good works, but the good work of Jesus Christ in Calvary when he died and paid for all our sins. That is our only hope. Sadly, the Jews relied not on the finished work of Jesus Christ, but they relied on their own good works. And because of this, they did not arrive at the righteousness that God required for salvation. And Paul summarized it quite succinctly in Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And this is what Paul says. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, Paul would not discount the fact that they were zealous. Paul would not discount the fact that they were sincere. But even though they were sincere, the sad thing was that they were sincerely wrong. And actually, millions of people will suffer the condemnation of hell for the simple reason that they are relying on their own righteousness. We can never, ever rely on our own righteousness. The only righteousness we can depend on is the righteousness of Christ. Once again, the righteousness which was wrought in Calvary through the cross of Jesus Christ. So we are left with the third religion, which is the heart religion. This is the only true religion which is based on the purity of the inner man. Of course, I have to make mention of the fact that this religion is only possible for those who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because apart from Jesus Christ, and apart from the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, we can never ever attain to purity of heart. And so this is only possible because the Holy Spirit in us convicts us of our sin and leads us into the righteousness of God. So this is the only true religion. Now it is the heart religion that we will be studying today. So we, were, we are going to have a heart checkup and hopefully as we go through this sermon, you will not have a spiritual heart attack. My prayer to God is that we would submit ourselves to the dean of all heart specialists, and that is none other than Jesus Christ himself. So allow me to present to you our sermon, which goes in two parts, and this is how it looks like. Again, we're going to talk about the happiness of those who are pure in heart, and if you want to be happy, if you want the favor of God, if you want the peace and the joy of God, then you have to enter into purity. You cannot enjoy the goodness of God. You cannot be truly happy unless, first of all, you are pure in heart. Now, we're going to come up with a definition and the importance of the heart, first of all. Because oftentimes our thinking is the heart is that organ, the internal organ in our body which pumps blood. I'd like to be able to debunk that because that's not what the Bible means. So we're going to define that and give its importance. And then we're going to segue and give a definition of the purity of heart and then the characteristics of a pure heart. We need to be able to describe that so that we know how it can play out in our lives. And then we're going to talk about the reward of the pure in heart. So shall we go and dive into the happiness of the pure in heart? And let's read verse 8, at least the first part of it right now. It says, blessed are the pure in heart. So let's come up with a definition and its importance. Now, the word heart comes from the Greek word cardia, wherein we get words like cardiac or cardiology. 
Now, obviously, these are terms or medical terms that we now use today. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, it is not the organ that pumps blood. Rather, the heart is the center of man's being and personality. Let me repeat once again. It is the center of man's being and personality. It actually involves our mind. And how do we know that? Well, just by taking a look at some verses of Scripture. For example, if we take a look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, this is what he says. It goes, For as he thinks, all right, that involves the mind, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink. Notice the last part of it. But his what? His heart is not with you. So notice the mind, the thinking is equated with the heart. Now, if we turn to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4, notice what it says here. And Jesus, knowing their what? Their thoughts said, why are you thinking evil where? In your hearts. So clearly, when the Bible speaks about the heart, it also speaks about the mind. But it is not just the mind. It also speaks about our will. It also speaks about our emotions. So all of that is involved in the function of our own heart. It likewise includes attitudes as well as motives, all right? So that is what is involved in the heart. Now, we can actually do a retranslation of that as we amplify this particular verse that we just read a while ago. So if we were to do a retranslation, which would amplify it for us, it would go something like this. Blessed are those who are pure, not merely on the surface or on the outside, but on the inside in their minds, in their emotions, in their motives, in their attitudes, and in their will. So once again, let me just repeat that. Blessed are those who are pure, not merely on the surface or on the outside, but on the inside, in their minds, in their emotions, in their motives, attitudes, and will. So that would be the amplified version of this verse of Scripture that you and I are studying. That is why the Christian life is ultimately concerned about the condition of our own heart. So again, what we need to be able to do this morning is take stock of ourselves, take stock of the inner person inside of us. Find out how our heart is, the spiritual state of our heart is in the presence of the Lord. Because oftentimes, we can gather together in a place like this, and we can mistake activism as spirituality. Well, let me tell you, we can be very, very active in the things of God. We can be very, very active with church activities, and yet it is so possible that our heart is not into it. The same thing about marriage. You can be staying together, living together under one roof, under one house, but it's possible that the passion is no longer there. Sometimes the things that have been marginalized are the things that are so obvious. Like, for example, loving Christ. That, I believe, is the center of everything that we do in our Christian lives. We need to be able to love God and abide in Christ at all times. And yet, sadly, as we survey the church of Ephesus, we find a very strong church, a very solid church, a church that was rooted and grounded in the Word of God, a church that was very active. They were doing a lot of good works. They protected and guarded the church. They prevented false teachings and false prophets and false teachers from entering the church. And yet they missed out on one very important element. And what was that? It was loving Jesus. And again, friends, we need to take stock of our hearts. What is the condition of our hearts? 
Now, if we take a look at Acts chapter 8, verses 18 to 22, just to give you a little background, what had happened was there was a great persecution that took place in Jerusalem, and many of the disciples were scattered. Philip himself found himself in Samaria, and he started to preach the gospel, and there were many people who came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Many Samaritans came to a relationship with the Lord, and one of those who had been converted was Simon, who was a magician previously. And so he was converted. He was even baptized. But the question, of course, was, was he really a Christian? Was the conversion genuine? And if we take a look at what happens next, it seems like the conversion was not really a genuine one. So allow me to read Acts 8, beginning at verse 18, and this is what it says. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Now, what exactly happened here when the people were empowered with the Spirit? Maybe there were signs, maybe there were manifestations, and Simon saw that. So he got attracted to that because, again, in his previous career, remember, he was a magician. He was obsessed with, with power. And he came in touch with the power as, as Peter laid hands on some of the people. And he wanted that. So here's what happened. He says to, um, um, in verse 18, let me just read it once again. It says, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them what? Money. Saying, Give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart, notice, for your heart is not right with God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord, if possible, that, and pray that the Lord, that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. So it seems quite clear here that the conversion was not a genuine one. And sometimes this is, this is the deterrent why some people do not come to church. They do not come to church because they do not sense the sincerity of people. To some people outside who are looking into the church, they see a lot of hypocrisy. They see a lot of insincerity. And that's why there are some millennials, actually, who are turned off with many Christians. They are turned off with the gospel because they do not see the light. They do not see the love. They do not see the genuineness. They do not see the authenticity. Uh, coming from Singapore, we, we met a lot of people. We had a global alliance dialogue, and it was a combination of pastors, uh, church leaders, uh, church movement leaders, and then also there were some business leaders as well. So it was a, a good combination, I would say, because everybody was, was very much involved. And one of the people that my wife and I got to meet was uh, Edward Ong. Edward Ong happens to be, if you're going to look at an equivalent of Edward Ong, he would be something like the Henry C. of Singapore, which probably means that he's even wealthier than, than um, Henry C. himself. But anyway, one of the things that my wife and I saw in him was his, was his great humility. And so in the dialogue, we were allowed uh, about five minutes, five to ten minutes, just to share what we wanted to share with the group. And so it so happened that the wife of Edward Ong also got to share. And this is what she shared. She shared about her conversation with her own daughters, and she asked this question, what is it that you are looking for among Christians? 
And the answer of the daughter was something that should make us think. And the answer was, what we are looking for is genuineness and authenticity. What we are looking for, and this is coming from the millennials, what we are looking for is genuineness and authenticity. You see, we can talk about lofty things. We can talk about religious things. We can talk about the Bible. We can talk about theology. But in the end, what people will attempt to read in us is not what we are saying. What people will attempt to read in us is our very lives. That is why the Bible calls us to live a life as shining lights, as Paul would say in the book of Philippians. Because as shining lights, we will be able to display a testimony which would cause people at least to take a look at the merits of our faith. And that's why it is very important to really uh, watch out for the condition of our hearts. Is there real authenticity? Is there real genuineness? Or are we faking it? When we're singing songs unto the Lord, are we really singing it from the heart? When we are serving God, do we serve God without grumbling and without complaining? Do we serve God really with gladness in our hearts? Is it really pure joy on our part to serve God? Do we really have this passion in our hearts for lost souls? These are questions we need to be asking ourselves. Because authenticity and genuineness is not only the very element that, that people are looking for, this is also the very element that God is actually looking for in our Christianity. God wants genuineness. God wants authenticity. God wants a pure heart. This is the reason why Saul failed. Now, initially, however, Saul, the king, was a good king, at least for 12 years. For 12 years, he was obedient to the prophet Samuel, and he was very humble, in fact. But then accomplishment and accomplishment began to pile up. He won so many wars until he became swell-headed. And so when he became swell-headed, he began to drift away from the Lord. And because of his drifting away from the Lord, he started to disobey God. And Samuel spoke to him one time in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, basically saying that God was going to replace him. And this, these are the words of Samuel. He said, the Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. God has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. And who was that man? Well, it was David. And how was David described? He was described as a man after God's own heart. I lay before you a question. If God were to describe your very life and your very heart, would he be able to say that you are a man and a woman after God's own heart? Would God be able to say to you that your life and your heart, your motives, your intentions, your attitudes are well-pleasing to Him? These are the things that we need to ask ourselves. It is not mere activism that should cause us to be satisfied with our Christian lives. There is really so much to improve on. And definitely our hearts are so deceitful. There's always that inner lawyer in us that tries to defend us, that tries to tell us that we're all right, we're fine, we're doing well. But are we really doing well? Is our heart really right with the Lord? Because this is of primary importance to God, our hearts. That's why, again, the Bible calls us to guard our hearts. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, could you please have a look at Proverbs 4 and verse 23? Here it goes. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. 
So the Bible calls us to watch over our hearts, but not just watch over our hearts, but to watch over it with all diligence. And why do you think the Bible calls us to watch it with diligence? Because we always have this tendency to drift away from the Lord. Oftentimes, when we live our lives, we tend to compartmentalize it into the secular as well as into the spiritual. So spiritual for us is Sunday. Secular for us is from Monday to Saturday. But you know, if we take a look at the scriptures, there is no such divide that you and I can find in the scriptures. Our lives, our Christian lives, are not divided into the spiritual and the secular. And one young man, actually very intelligent, asked me, a very inquisitive question. And he said to me, he asked me, doesn't the Bible say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And how is that even possible? And he was thinking in terms of the fact that he was working, he had a business, and he was involved in so many things. And so he was wondering, how is it even possible to really love God with all of your heart? But you see, I think the confusion arises because we have divided the secular as well as the spiritual. As I mentioned to you, there is no such divide. So he said, please give me an illustration just so I can understand a bit of the concept of loving God. So I gave him an illustration. I said, you know, this illustration is going to be a limping illustration. But I hope that it will make you understand what loving God means. So I say, just imagine a pizza pie. Of all the illustrations, I got to think about the pizza pie. And so I said, a pizza pie has so many slices. Just imagine those slices as parts of your life. You can talk about marriage as one slice. You can talk about your work as one slice. You can talk about raising your children as one slice, your ministry as one slice, and, go, and so on and on. I said, this is how you're supposed to look at it. Loving God is actually looking at it as the whole pizza. The whole pizza is your life in God. The whole pizza is about loving God. So if I were to explain this in practical terms, it would go something like this. The Bible says, love your wife as what? As Christ loved the church. So I love God by what? By loving my wife. And then the Bible says that we are to obey our masters as to the Lord, the Bible says. So I can be working in a company, definitely that's secular, but it is also spiritual if I treat it as spiritual. So I can love God by being submissive, by working in excellence in my own field. That becomes my worship unto the Lord. That is why the Bible says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. So there's no divide. The problem is, really, our hearts are divided. We have a divided allegiance before the Lord. And that will simply not work. We have to have this consciousness and awareness of God every single day of our lives because every single day is actually a gift from God. Amen? God did not just give us Sunday, brothers and sisters. God gave us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All of those days are given to us by the Lord, and they are given as our stewardship before Him. Now, we have been placed by God in different places, in different works, in different careers, but the whole point is this. We are to live our lives for the glory of God. And that is how you and I love the Lord. Oftentimes, we find ourselves having a grumbling and complaining spirit. You know why? Because we have lost our awareness and our consciousness of God. And so what happens when you are in your workplace, for example, you begin to hate your boss. You, be, you begin to hate your, your office mates. It becomes something like a competition. 
And you begin to, to hate even the people who are under you. Why has that happened? Once again, because you have treated the spiritual and the secular as apart from each other. No, they're not apart. We have got to understand that our whole life is meshed together with Christ. It is no longer I who live, the Bible says, but it is Christ who lives in me. The impure heart, by the way, is the seat of all our troubles. Why do you think God caused a flood to cause a global cataclysm? Well, let's go to the Bible. Let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And here's what it says. Genesis 6, Genesis 6 verse 5 states that man's every intent of the thoughts, notice again the mind, notice every intent of the thoughts of his what? Of his heart was only what? Evil continually. That's the reason for this global cataclysm, which we call as the flood. And again, it happened. Why? Because the hearts of people were so wicked. They were so ripe for judgment, and God judged the world at that time, sparing only Noah and his family. In Matthew 15, 19, this is what it states. Jesus speaking, it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, of murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. So if you're ever wondering where are all these things coming from, the massacres, the rapes, even this uh, voyeurism, this, uh, I know you've heard this news in Cebu wherein there were some senior high students who molested a girl who was unconscious and they posted it on Messenger. And it became viral. I mean, where do these things come from? Comes from the heart. Now, some people will argue only, only if there was a, a perfect environment. If only the environment were perfect, none of these things would ever take place. So if we really want to change people, some people will say, you need to change the environment. Now, while I would like to agree to a certain extent that the environment is a contributing factor, it is not the all-important factor. Because if we take a look at Adam and Eve, where were they born or where were they created? They were created where? In paradise, in the Garden of Eden. Now, let me ask you this question. Was, was it an imperfect environment? Or was it a perfect environment? It was a perfect environment. And yet it was in this perfect environment that Adam and Eve sinned against God. So ultimately, it's not about a perfect environment. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 tells us the crux of the problem. It states, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. That is the main problem. If you were a spiritual doctor and you want a proper diagnosis of what is really wrong with society, there is the root problem. The root problem is the heart. Ultimately, it's not about politics. Ultimately, it's not about personalities. Ultimately, it is the human heart that is the main problem. So if you want to change society, what needs to be changed is the human heart. Again, some people will say education is so important. And again, we, we don't want to disagree with the importance of education. But if you're relying on education to change people, I have bad news for you. You can come from the best schools in the world, the best schools from, from the Philippines, and yet it is never a guarantee that you will turn out to be a good person or a good citizen of this country. Let me just share a few examples from some of the premier schools in our, in our country. I recall there was this Athenian who was uh, voted to be the most likely to succeed 
in his, in his class, and yet he was into gun running. I know this person from, from De La Salle University, and probably you've, you've heard about it in the news, who stole millions of pesos and dollars and, and took it out of our country. Now, is that, what do you call that? Well, you find an educated thief. Educated well, but an educated thief. And there was this guy who studied in UP. His father was a judge, and yet he was a drug addict. And so again, just to bring home my point, we can come up with, you know, solutions like education and say it's going to change people. Ultimately, it's not going to change people. It's still, the bottom line is still about the heart. It is the heart that should change. Once the heart changes, your whole life changes. Allow me to give you a little illustration. Um, there was this man by the name of Martin Yu. He was actually a very lazy person. He did not keep his house. He did not clean his house. His house was dirty. It was unkept. But one time he saw in a store a very beautiful vase. And he fell in love with his beautiful vase. So he bought it. And he put it in his living room. He put it on a table. And immediately as he put that beautiful vase on that table, it became a judgment to all of his surroundings. He began to see the walls, were, which were now, um, you know, worn out. There was no longer new paint. He saw the old chair. He saw the dirt, the uncleanness. And it was all because of this beautiful vase. And as a result of that, guess what he did? He started to renovate the whole place. He started to paint the walls. He started to put some, um, what do you call this, wallpaper. He took out the old chair. He started to clean the house. He started to arrange everything. And before you know it, the whole place was transformed. Why? All because of that beautiful vase. That serves as an illustration. You want society to change? You want your family to change? It all begins with this. The heart is our beautiful vase. It is something that will change the whole thing. So let's define what purity is or purity of heart. Pure comes from the Greek word katharos, from which we get catharsis, a term which means cleansing of mind and emotions. It means, it means make pure by cleansing from dirt, filth, and contamination. The Greek word, by the way, is related to the Latin castus, from which we get the word chaste. And also another word would be chasten. Now, what does chasten mean? It means to discipline in order to cleanse from wrong behavior. So what I get reminded of with this definition is the book of Hebrews, which tells us that God disciplines us. And why does God discipline us? He disciplines us for our own good, so that the fruit of righteousness might come out in our lives. So when we're not paying attention to God, when we're not listening, God will be shouting at our spiritual ears. And he can do that how? Sometimes we can get sick. Sometimes unfortunate circumstances can take place. Sometimes there are certain people who would come to us, people who are like a Nathan to us, and they will tell us what is wrong with us. Why do you think God would do that? Why would God make us uncomfortable? Why would God allow us to go, th go through some inconvenience or adversities or trials in life? Why? To catch our attention, to grab our attention, to cleanse and wash our lives. And we are to welcome the discipline of the Lord. We are not to despise the discipline of the Lord. We are not to take lightly the discipline of the Lord. We are not to faint when the discipline of God comes before us. We are to welcome it. We are to embrace it and allow it to cleanse, wash, and sanctify our lives. It is really for our own good. 
That is why it is very important to be sensitive. When, when some things happen to us, we need to be asking the question, Lord, why are, you, why are you allowing these things to happen? What is it that you want to change in me? What is it, Lord, that I need to develop? And maybe there are certain things that you need to get rid in your life, certain idols in your life. Now, once again, the Greek term was often used of metals that had been refined until all the impurities were removed, leaving only pure metal. In that sense, purity means unmixed, unalloyed, unadulterated. Oftentimes, if we were to be honest, our hearts are filled with grime, with filth, and with dirt. And we have got to allow God to purify our hearts. You know, there's this statue in Canterbury, uh, which is supposed to represent Prince Edward of Wales. And over the years, when you will take a look at, uh, at this uh, statue, it had become black because of the suit and the animal coating. And it seemed appropriate. Why? Because when Prince uh, Edward would go into war, he would actually wear a black armor. So people had always thought that this statue was really black until some people decided to remove the animal coating and the grime and they realized after cleaning it up it was really made of pure gold and sometimes that's what god does in our hearts he cleanses us he washes us so that the gold which is inside our hearts would ultimately come out now let's talk about the characteristics of a pure heart. So we're going to have a little heart checkup, all right? First, a pure heart separates itself from that which contaminates it. Once again, it separates itself from that which contaminates it. I don't know if you've observed flies, all right? Maybe you've, you've seen them alight even on your soup. <laughs> and haven't you noticed that even though they alight on your soup, they're still able to fly away? Maybe you've observed them in certain streams of water that they would alight and they would fly. And you would think, how is that possible? If, they're if their wings are wet, how can they fly? Well, let me tell you what the flies actually do. They don't actually wet their wings. When they land on water, what they do actually is they, they spread their wings. They actually lift their wings so that it does not touch the water. All right? That's the reason why even though they can alight on water, they can still fly away. And basically, it's a picture of what needs to happen in our lives. We can't help it that the world that we are living in is perverse, it is immoral, and it's wicked, it's corrupt. I mean, we, we can't simply escape that. When we go to our offices, when we go to our schools, that's what we meet. People speak about, you know, they, they joke around and they have these green jokes. And some people tempt us and invite us to do certain crazy things. We can't help that. That is part of the environment that we live in. But just like the fly, we need to lift our wings so that we do not get contaminated. I recall the story of a, uh, a pastor. Uh, his doctor was quite concerned about him, concerned about his health. So this doctor said, I'm going to give you some tickets because I want you to enjoy yourself. The problem was he was given tickets to a kind of entertainment that pastors should not be going to. And so when, he, when the pastor got the ticket from the doctor, he said, I'm sorry, doctor, I, I really can't go to this. And the doctor said, why? Can, can't you have a little fun? And the pastor said to the doctor, who happened to be a surgeon, he said to the doctor, you are a surgeon, right? 
And as a surgeon, you always wash your hands. You never operate on your parent, I'm sorry, on your patients with dirty hands. You never operate on your patients with dirty hands. The same thing with me. I am in a work that entails souls. Soul, soil, I'm sorry, souls. And because I am in this kind of a job, I cannot have a dirty life. And so again, friends, a pure heart separates itself from that which contaminates it. Number two, it is cleansed without defilement. It only seeks to do that which is pleasing to God. He seeks to maintain a clean conscience. You know, there was this Scotsman who had his favorite shirt, but he did not wash it. For as long as it seemed like it was clean, he continued to wear it. And so what he would do is he would, he would look at the shirt, okay? He would, he would look at it with, with a light on it, and for as long as he felt it was all right, he still continued to wear it. His wife became irritated. And so one time, the husband was, was staring at his shirt if he could still wear it. And the wife said, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. And basically, isn't it true that sometimes there are certain struggles that we have in our conscience? And we're, we're wavering, we're uh, going left and right. Sometimes we go left field, sometimes we go right field, and we're wondering, am I supposed to do this? Or am I supposed to, to stay away from this? Once again, the rule is, if it's something that makes you doubt, then it's not good for you. Stay away from it. Third, its motives are pure. We are to do things not because we will gain power, we will gain fame, we will gain money. We do things out of a pure heart. And again, this goes with what we do in church as well. We can actually be part of the worship team and not do it for God, we can do it for ourselves to showcase our talents, to showcase our gifts. We can do it that way. A person can preach from the pulpit, and he may be preaching not because he wants people to be blessed or he wants people to grow into spiritual maturity, but maybe he can be doing it for the sake of money, for example. And we know a lot of preachers who are like that. They preach not because they're really concerned about souls, but because they want to get into the pockets of certain people. The motives are simply not pure. Then fourth, there must be no hypocrisy. In other words, there, it should be without hypocrisy. I don't know if you've seen this bright blue butterfly that has jewel-like gold spots on its wings. It's really so beautiful. But you know what? It has an abhorrent habit. You know what it is? It has a very disgusting habit. And its disgusting habit is this. This beautiful butterfly eats dung. It eats dung. And I, again, friends, sometimes that's how it is with some of us. Oftentimes, we are the last to recognize this among ourselves. The bishop of Hereford was once insulted by a wealthy man, and he said, I never go to church. And bishop, perhaps you know the reason why I do not go to church. It is because there are so many hypocrites in church. And the bishop looked at this wealthy man and said, don't be bothered by that. We can have one more, one more place for another hypocrite. <laughs> one time, there were two men who met on the street, and one said, have you heard about Harry? He embezzled half a million dollars. The other said, terrible. 
The first one continued, not only that, he took Tom's wife with him. The second said, oh, that's awful. The first said, not only that, he stole a car to make a getaway. That's scandalous, said the other one. And the other one replied, Harry's no good. But what really bothers me is who is going to teach his Sunday school next week? This guy was a Sunday school teacher. Number five, a pure heart has a single-eyed devotion. The problem with us many times is we have a divided heart. We love the Lord, but we love ourselves more. We love the Lord, and yet we love the things of the world even more. You know, there was a survey that was done several years ago here in the Philippines, and the question that was asked was this, what is the most important thing for you? 60% of Filipinos said that the most important thing to them is money. And we call ourselves a Christian nation. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that we cannot serve both God and what? And mammon. And yet, we call ourselves a Christian nation, and 60% of us say the most important thing to us is money. Our hearts are not fully devoted to God. You know, there was this husband and wife conversation. And the wife said, let's go to church. The husband said, I don't feel like going to church. And so the wife asked him, well, what is the reason why you don't want to go to church? And the husband uh, shot back at his wife and said, I have three good reasons why I don't want to go to church. Number one, the church is cold. I don't feel love in the church. Number two, people in the church don't like me. That's why I don't want to go to church. And third, I just don't want to go. And the wife said, well, I have three reasons why you need to go to the church. Number one, it's wrong that you're saying that the church is cold. They're, the people are actually warm. And number two, there are some people who actually like you. A few people who like you. And number three, you're the pastor. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Psalm 86, verse 11. The prayer of the psalmist, unite my heart. Unite my heart. That's our problem, oftentimes. A divided heart. A divided allegiance. And again, we need to ask ourselves certain questions like, if some of us are seeking the kingdom, are we seeking it first? The Bible is very clear. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Number two, question. Do we believe that God is our highest good? Again, let's, let's really... Pay attention to those questions. Is God, could you honestly say that God is your highest good? That nothing else compares to God. That God is your chief and supreme treasure. That even if God removes everything else for as long as he does not remove his presence in your life, you could still say, it is well with my soul. Can you honestly say that? You know, one, one time uh, in England, what Queen Victoria would often do is she would visit uh, some of the, the poor areas in London. And this was, there was this uh, poor widow that she visited who was a very strong Christian. But you see, the neighbors probably being envious and jealous that Queen Victoria went into her house, asked her this question, attempting to taunt her, by the way. And the question was, who is 
the most honored guest that came into your house? And the answer of the woman was, well, that's a no-brainer. Of course, Queen Victoria. And her neighbor said, aha! But you've always said that, that Jesus is your most honored guest. And the lady shot back at them and said, no, Jesus is not the most honored guest in this house. My Jesus, my Savior, lives here. Amen. My Jesus and my Savior lives here. So we ask, what is the reward of those who are pure in heart? And here's the reward. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Give the Lord a big hand, please. Let me end with Proverbs 24, verse 3, and it states, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. You will only be able to see God if your heart is pure. The Greek, by the way, here is in the future indicative tense and the middle voice. And a more literal translation would go something like this. They shall be continuously be seeing God for themselves. Again, they shall be continuously be seeing God for themselves. There is a present and a future aspect to this. Right now, although we do not see God literally, the promise of Jesus Christ is that if we keep his commandments, listen well, he will manifest himself to us. He will manifest himself to us. And that is why for some of us, we understand what the presence of God is all about. This is the reason why some of us could say the presence of God was really intimate and special today. This is the reason why some of us could say the presence of God was so thick today. Why? Because God manifests His presence to us. Amen. He manifests His presence to us. And in the end, in the end, we shall see the face of our Lord, our Master, and our Savior. Amen. So I most certainly hope that this sermon has not cost you a heart attack. After we've gone through a spiritual inventory, know this, if there is some pain in your heart because of this sermon, just try to imagine the pain in God's heart whenever we are unfaithful to Him. That is why let us pray to God, just like the psalmist, Change my heart, O oh God. Amen? Change my heart, O oh God. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes at this time. I'd like to address the people here today. And as we spoke about the sermon, probably it cost you to begin questioning your relationship with the Lord. Maybe you just realized that with all the things that describes the pure in heart, you simply don't have it. That your heart is far from God. That your heart is not in the right place. That you do not have a relationship with the Lord. Today, I issue you an invitation. An invitation to have a relationship with Christ. And to have a relationship with Christ is not about your performance. It is not about your good works. Because as I mentioned to you a while ago, your performance and your good works will not 
save your soul. God is not looking at that because his standard is perfection. So what is he looking at? He is looking at a heart that is willing to surrender to him. A heart that says, Lord, I thank you that you died on the cross for me. And my heart is grateful. And Lord, I do not want to spurn and reject the gift of forgiveness. And Lord, please forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I want you to reign in my heart. I want you to be seated on the throne of my heart. So Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of all my sins. But change me and make me the kind of person you want me to be. Now, if you pray that prayer sincerely from the bottom of your heart, you will receive salvation, the free gift of eternal life. But remember this, it's not the prayer itself that creates that relationship. What creates that relationship is the sincerity of your heart. If that is what you want, I'd like to lead you in prayer. Actually, you can pray on your own. But I'm just wondering, some of you may not know how to express that faith right now. I can help you. So I'd like to guide you and lead you. And if there's anyone in this hall right now who wants to have a relationship with Christ, could you please slip up your right hand or left hand before the Lord? Yes, sister. Amen. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Amen. Yes, brother. Amen. Yes, sisters. Yes, brother. Amen. Yes, sister. I see your hand. Yes, brother. Amen. I see those hands at the back. Amen. Yes, brother. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Yes, brother. Amen. Yes, brother. I see that hand. Amen. You can put them down right now. I'd like you to please pray this prayer. Again, the heart is important. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask for forgiveness for all my sins. Cleanse me and wash me from all unrighteousness. And Jesus, I want to thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And right now, right now, Lord, I'm yours. Make me the kind of person you want me to be even as I accept the free gift of eternal life, as I repent of all the things that I have done. In Jesus' blessed name, I pray. Amen and amen.